Welcome everyone to another edition of the Civ Battle Royale. This is part 98, Pave the Ocean. My name is Dawkins and let's get right into it. Welcome to part 98 of the Civ Battle Royale. I am a Kratic Critic, Inuit supporter, and we kick things off with Silver Phalanx's fitting depiction of the Boar's newly acquired statue of Liberty in the rubble of Agra. It is pretty weeaboo. Edzy 1991 puts the casualties of the Boer Vietnam War in perspective with this map from all the way back in part 19, showing all of the ancient cities that had been nuked off the map during the conflict. If you notice, I believe there are 13 civilizations here showing and only three remain. It's been a long time since part 19. As always, we also have our wonderful tile accurate map. Sweden will really be feeling the squeeze from their two recent wars. There's not very much tile separating Iceland and Sibir now. And surprise, surprise, the boards continue to sit on top of the PR leadership boards. But the surge of Brazilian tourism to Africa is beginning to shake the rankers once rock solid confidence in the Reich. We open with a shot of ever-glorious Armenia, prophesied by Blue Cassette themselves to one day defeat the evil Boer Reich and free the internet from Skynet's grip. Until they get around to that, however, they've settled for slightly inconveniencing the Boer reinforcements trying to reach the Vietnamese front, hey, they gotta start somewhere, and recreating the Manhattan Project from a stolen Boer child science kit. Not too eager to let the Reich keep the Statue of Liberty and its multiple thousands of hammer bonus, the Trung sisters send units to assault Agra from the north. They might manage to flip the city a few times, but Kruger's steady flow of reinforcements should claim victory in the long run. Thai Li B9 keeps flipping back to Vietnam, and Panduranga looks to follow next turn. Australia no longer has the numbers to make any serious pushes on this front, but the Peacekeeper Patrol and Vietnam's lack of a local navy should stop the momentum from turning against Parks. Parks' biggest problem here is the awful composition of his land army. For a start, it's a bit Sammy, and he should talk to his opposition about what an over-reliance on drones does to you. Maybe it's contagious in the area. He'd do well to peace out now and focus on building up his valuable beachhead for the next war. Big Carrier's grip extends even to Hawaii, composing over half of their navy. Their Australian counterparts apparently don't have anywhere more useful to be right now, and in the corner, we see the White Walkers are scheming against Kamehameha. Come on, Ekanik, you've got plenty of relevant civs, and you should not waste your time with bullshit. The former last bastion of freedom, Lhasa, is currently working on an engineering module, presumably to ensure the Trungs don't lack for production if they need to evacuate to the ISS. The Brazilian citizens of Campina starve as the government hoards supplies to feed their expanding legions of paratroopers. Pedro also seems to have decided that you don't need a navy if you build enough hover tanks. A Boer biotrooper captures Trincomalee, but Vietnam should take it back shortly. This is not looking like they're, the Boers are invading from multiple fronts. Sri Lanka has open borders, but interestingly, don't seem to have the same relationship with the Trungs. Could Sri Lanka's relevance finally be found and the Power Rankers wormhole be stopped? No. The Cham Coast is reclaimed by the Trungs and Hoi An has been abandoned by its conquerors. The population of Hanoi breathes a sigh of relief. Unless the Kimberley decide to join Australia, the capital shouldn't fall in the near future. Tianjin has flipped, but Vietnamese reinforcements out of Fang Chao will likely flip it back. Sejong could make more gains by attacking now. Small as his land army is, it's enough to overwhelm the Australians. The Ice Sheet fleet may have mostly avoided Big Carrier's corruption, but their Korean branch is doing their best to send Ekonik some free samples. The difference in naval unit bias between the Inuit and Blackfoot is obvious, with the latter having almost exclusively melee units and the former lacking any on this slide. Crowfoot might have a large carpet, but it's largely outdated and won't stand up to the Inuit biotroopers and robot infantry when the glacier inevitably swallows their land. Their impressive air force might let them flip a few cities though. Every Blackfoot city in this slide has a 10 stack while the White Walkers have zero. Fun fact, the Inuit have as many settlers as cities on this slide. 
Mongolia is in basically the same spot as the Blackfoot, an outdated carpet waiting for someone more powerful to bother attacking them. Sabir does seem to be bringing more air and ground units to the border. Is Kuchum Khan's plan offense or simply defense? Uh, wow. I guess this is where Brazil's sending most of their new units. Those units are not to be sneezed at either. There are a lot of XCOMs between those weaker paratroopers and mobile SAMs, and even some robot infantry. Per Civ AI game wizard Admiral Cloudberg, the Brazilians won't be expelled after a declaration of war, so Pedro could devour a huge part, potentially all of the frontrunner's core if he wanted to, especially if the rest of Africa is as low on board units as this area. Sabir made a wise choice getting out of this war while they were ahead. Now they, and Sweden, need to rebuild and carpet up, and with a military, not workers. It's also worth noting that Sweden now has only a single land tile south of Lapinaranta, connecting their Scandinavian core with their mainland European holdings. Only one citadel would ruin that entire experience. The mostly empty new Boer lands would be vulnerable right now if any of their neighbors were in a state to attack them, which they aren't. In other news, Sri Lanka and Armenia continue to exist and get in the way of Kruger's Vietnamese-bound units, and Exclavia continues to lack the units to get in anyone's way. Agra may be Vietnamese again, but Fujian has been nuked off the map, and the unit numbers are now decisively in Kruger's favor. If the Trungs can't hold him at the mountains, their northern lands and damaged core will look very vulnerable. The minimap shows they haven't even been able to kick Kruger out of southern India, which should have been easy. Oh boy, Vietnam, you have fallen very far. I think the local Vietnamese commander must be away on vacation. Seriously, I know the terrain sucks, but you could at least try to take the city back. At least the advanced destroyer should do that next turn. Vietnam continues to embark units without naval support, and the Australian cyber subs continue to use them for target practice. The Kimberley briefly considered doing something relevant with their overflowing units, but decided that would be too much effort. Dong Hoi and Tianjin swap owners, but with only a near-dead anti-aircraft gun and some damaged biodrones as backup, Australia looks to be evicted from Dong Hoi shortly. The Middle East is still full of border gore and absolutely no events of relevance. Tiridates has reportedly decided that being the chosen hero of prophecy is too hard and changed some flight schedules to land all those Brazilian units in Africa so Pedro could do it instead. Hashtag Tiragate. Agra predictably flips back to Kruger. Vietnam has a better hope of holding on to the north though, with mountains and Brazilians making troop movements in a nightmare for invaders. Lahore in particular will be very difficult to capture as there are no south-facing entrances through the surrounding mountains. A shot slightly further south reveals some Vietnamese backup has arrived around Balk. Perhaps they will prove more effective than their predecessors. The days of the Boers not knowing what a naval unit was are long gone, and they've even managed to produce slightly more non-carrier units than carriers. They still don't know how to get the ships to go somewhere. They might actually be useful, though. Also, more Brazilian overflow units. Are they a sign that the Boer Corps has also been flooded with lost carnival attendees, or merely a few lost stragglers? Furious at Tiridates' abandonment of the prophecy, Parakramabahu briefly wakes from hibernation to plot vengeance. Please do it. Then maybe you'll both accumulate enough of a warmongering penalty for Kruger to do the cylinder a favor and end you. A look at the capital city of one of the potential combatants, quote-unquote, reveals that Sri Lanka is growing its navy with the production of a nuclear submarine. Not sure what you're planning to do to Armenia with that. Maybe they've confused it with something else that's cylindrical and nuclear. Is that a dick joke? Hoyan and Dong Hoi to the north have both been reclaimed. Hopefully Australia still has more units in real-world China than are on the slide, otherwise their Asian foothold is looking mightily tenuous. Hordes of Blackfoot tourists and a Hawaiian great engineer crowd Japan. In Seoul, Sejong orders a nationwide broadcast to once again remind everyone how big and strong his navy is. 
Big carrier executives stand at his shoulders, ensuring he sticks to their prepared script. Oh, shoot. Um, apparently regretting his choice to let Engelfer have Tonsberg, Gustavus orders his commanders to chuck all those rebuilding plans out of the palace window and declare war. The 61 visible Swedish aircraft, not counting the three missiles on cyber subs, immediately reduce Put City in the black, and an organic infantry is positioned to take it next turn. Might want to move those 10 air units, Engelfer. Orleans, Cologne, Hamburg, and Malmo are bombed straight into the black, and Berlin is captured. Both sides lack units on the mainland, but damn, the Swedish Air Force is not messing around. Gustavus also appears to have the naval advantage, with Iceland only displaying leftovers from carrier corps' Pave the Ocean TM initiative. At least some have planes on them. What is happening? The Boer Carrier Party watches as Sweden captures Ellis in Constantinople. Messine, Kume, Tegia, and Corinth are very weakly defended and in the black. Sweden has more units by far, but they're mostly organic infantry versus Icelandic biotroopers and robot infantry. Will numbers or technology prevail? And in a simultaneous declaration of war, Genghis has tired of hearing the echoes of Darkon's rapping over the mountains and resolved to deliver the final blow to the former number ones. He's bought modern naval melee units to the party too, so we may be hearing the final lines of Trigger Darkon's rapping career. Man, this is getting hyped. What the hell? It's a new turn in Yakusha still exists, but that's not the most important thing right now. Inuit have declared war on Iceland. Holy shit. Finally, the White Walkers hear the pleas of their fans and declare war on someone they can actually reach. It's time to see who the true ice people are. Ugh, Christmas has come early. So naturally, we cut to a shot of the Borabian Desert. Uh-huh. Kruger still hasn't gotten around to annexing these captured Vietnamese cities, but he has settled Helsingborg and populated it with six air units. Is that like a joke? Is that a troll? Helsingborg? Uh, Helsingborg? Really? Come on, this stuff writes itself. Engelfer wastes no time in scrambling reinforcements, and suddenly Sweden's numerical advantage is almost gone. They did still manage to capture Corinth, Tegia, and Messine, although a robot infantry and biotrooper of the fake ice people are about to take it back. Man <laughs> Mantanea appears to have been nuked, uh, with its population dropping from 13 to 9 and damaged units all around. Boy, Iceland, you better put up a good fight. Tonsberg is Swedish again. Iceland still lacks anything resembling a real navy up here, but luckily for them, Sweden forgot to build any naval melee units, so Gustavus will struggle to capitalize on his superiority. And finally, we get to the war everyone, me, really wants to see. The Ice Sheet Fleet should clean up the Icelandic Navy, owing to their secret tactic of not being half-carriers, but all those annoying peacekeepers will make it near impossible to penetrate further into Greenland. Oh well, at least we'll get the coastal cities and Iceland won't be able to get any units to reclaim them. Okay, Pedro, it's been ages since us Inuit fans got a good war, so please don't mess this up for us. I mean, it... Like, if your paratroopers make this end in a boring peace deal, I'll give Carnival a bad review on Yelp. So, consider yourself warned. Anyway, St. Louis is bombed into the red, but the surrounding Icelandic and Brazilian units will likely prevent a capture for the moment. Even more carriers down here, they'll make good target practice, and most of all, they're going to give all of these Navy units the much-needed XP they'll need to just crush over Iceland. The technologically inferior nations of the world shoot down a repeal of scholars and residents, co-led by Sam Houston from his battleship hideout. As the original headquarters of Carrier Corps, the Bucks have certainly kept up with the world leaders in terms of useless navies. Maybe they're using them to transport all of their giant death robots. I count 10 of them on this slide, which is higher concentration than we've seen in any other Civ as far as I recall. Iceland's superior units are starting to reach the front lines, and despite the nuke damage to many around Mantanea, I predict that Sweden will have a tough time holding what they captured in the initial rush, let alone making any further gains. Messina and Tegia in particular seem likely to flip in the next turn or two. 
With the way things are already going, you wonder if Sweden made the right choice in declaring war. But with the Inuit on the opposite side pushing that front, perhaps this is the end of Iceland. Tianjin has flipped since we last saw it, but Vietnam still has more units in the area. Australia is running out of steam, and they won't be able to easily reinforce. Now, if only the Trungs could have the same success on their western front. The strategic map clearly shows the nuclear hellfire that both Kruger and Trungs have unleashed on this front. Fallout covers the region, but the cybernetic and mutated warriors feel no fear because they physically can't. They have only one purpose, and emotion is irrelevant. But can they love? Sweden's core hasn't been spared the horrors of war, with Stockholm itself being caught in a nuclear blast. You brought this on yourself, Gustavus. I hope it was worth it. Also, an observant viewer may have noticed something on the minimap. The power rankers have gotten their wish. Yakusha is no more. The last nuclear subs look on as Mongol choppers hover above the destroyed city walls, and an advanced destroyer sails triumphantly into the ruins of Beryazovo's harbor. Ranked at the top spot in the power rankings from parts 1 through 7, Taigen Dakan ultimately failed to capitalize on its strong start. The Snoryaks excelled at mediocrity and, of course, triggered Archon's beats. The most memorable deed of Yakusha was getting locked into a centuries-long meat grinder with the Inuit in Kamchatka, reducing the once pristine Arctic waters into a radioactive wasteland. Although the Koreans finally stomped their empire into the ground, the Snoryaks persisted in this frozen city and the Mongols finally delivered the long sleep they had forever desired. Goodbye, Darkon. May you drift forever through the heavens, propelled by your sick fires. Unfortunately, Armenia is still here and they've just entered the information era, which means we get another slide with them in it. Yay! Is there anything I can talk about that isn't Armenia? Hmm, looking at the minimap. Oh hey, Vietnam kicked the Boers out of southern India at some point. Sweden captured Cologne and so many interesting non-Armenian world events. But Armenia is still strong and if the prophecy is true, sooner or later they're going to turn the tide against the orange menace. Good news for Sweden. They snuck in a unit to capture Cologne. The British Isles are full of Brazilians rather than Icelanders, and their navy has melted the Icelandic sea pavement fleet. Bad news is that Iceland has bottled Sweden's units up in Denmark, has Berlin mostly surrounded, and will soon take back Cologne oh, anyway, because Sweden didn't send reinforcements. Iceland's western navy is disintegrating as expected, and the Inuit have embarked melee units ready to assault... Oh god, Icelandic. Natafarovic. I hope I got that one. Alternatively, they could raise it to give one of those settlers hovering around Oshawa something to do. I know this part has been exciting, but it is time to come to an end. It's time for the info attic slides. The Boers continue to lead substantially in population, but Brazil's rise has not been constrained to military alone. They've overtaken the Inuit sometime in the last few parts to claim third place. Vietnam has actually increased by 3 million since last part, which is... I have no idea how that happened. Mongolia manages to trail behind the single city of Kanaohe of Hawaii, showing that despite their euthanasia of Yakusha, they're still far from being a serious contender. Sweden's stubborn refusal to rebuild hasn't done them any favors either, and they're sitting narrowly ahead of the Kimberley. The Boers and Inuit dominate in terms of production, with Australia sitting in third place, 8,500 hammers behind. Brazil is only in fifth, with half that of the Inuit, which really demonstrates how much one of the top two could explode militarily if they put their minds to it. Kruger might want to consider that in light of the Brazilian occupation of Africa. The Mongolians are slightly less disappointing here, but still trail the pack of non-rump states. The large divide between Korea and Sweden doesn't bode well for their war with Iceland in the long term. Brazil continues to grow their military, as do the surprisingly high-ranked Blackfoot. Yeah, boy! I do wonder how well Future Worlds weighs its units in this stat. Empires with large but heavily outdated militaries seem to be disproportionately high ranked. Despite Vietnam taking a huge hit to their military lately, I would certainly back them over Mongolia in a war with their existing units. Give it time though, because as technology creeps up, and that is inevitable, 
those two armies of Mongolia, Brazil, and the Blackfoot are going to get that much stronger. So you number one civs, Boers, the Inuit, everybody else, you need to be worried and you need to stop them before they stop you. The dead empires of Yakusha and Texas straddle our outdated sub. Yakusha's subs will quite likely survive under the Arctic ice sheet, so they'll continue to be a fixture in these slides for some time. Lutheranism's presence in the high population Boer core ensures it has almost as many followers as Arianism, despite being less widespread. Australia leads both with Catholicism, though, after tales of the chosen kangaroo was born in the city of Tokyo. With all three major religions converging on Europe, it'll be interesting to see if one dominates. And with that, we come to the end of this part. This has been a Cratic Critic, and it's been a pleasure to be a part of the CBR. See you all to get hyped for the next part. And my name is Dawkins, thank you for joining us for part 98. It's been pretty exciting. I'm sorry that it was, I guess, a little bit shorter than it usually is. It is the holiday season. I will have this out for you on Tuesday. And uh, hopefully everybody has a happy and healthy new year. Happy holidays. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>